All oh, right, Cleo Wright is going to make all our photos beautiful. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so so in one hour, I don't hope to be able to cover all of that ground, whatever that takes. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about, and maybe de demystify, um, some of the process that photographers go through to generate what they generate. I think a lot of times people think that if I just click the shutter and I use the right settings, that everything's going to look fantastic. And that isn't necessarily true. Um, clicking the shutter is only part of the process. So I'm going to talk today a little bit about the whole process of photography, compare the digital world to what used to be done a little bit, and then maybe at least point you all in the right direction on maybe some things that you might be able to do to um, improve your photography going forward if that's what you want to do. Um, so I'm going to go back and forth here. Here's our, here's our topics for today. Talk about photography briefly. Um, how do cameras work? Look at you know what is it that some of the famous <clears throat> photographers did in the past? How did they uh, how did they achieve what they achieved? Um, about getting to locations, and I'm going to focus uh, again. I think it's said in the materials that it, mostly on landscape and nature photography because that's mostly what I do. But, um, so we'll we'll talk mostly about that. Um, talk a little bit about equipment in the digital darkroom, and then about maybe some things you can do to unleash your your own creativity. So, modern cameras, lots of parts. We won't go through all of this. Um, it looks like a lot sometimes, but when you really understand the basics, it's really not much. We won't go into much of that. Um, today, almost all photography is done in the digital world, though people still do use film. Um, I started with film and did it for a long time. So I have some black and white negatives here, or some slide film. I've even shot with the, the old, you know, you see the camera with the people under the hood and everything like that, right? So slides with that, or negatives with that. Lots of different stuff. But today, most things are done on digital sensors. And so how does a digital sensor work? There are some varieties, but in general, most of them work the same way. There are lots of little individual pixels on a digital sensor, and in front of those pixels, there's a mask. So that some of those pixels will pick up red light, different values of red light, some will pick up different values of green light, and the others will pick up different values of blue. And so they record those signals electronically, and it's processed through an image processor, and it eventually turns into an image. A lot of computer work going on behind the, behind the scenes. The same sorts of stuff was done in the old film world, but instead of having electronic signals that recorded the wavelengths of light, you had, first it was silver crystals, right? Silver salt crystals that would react to the light and grow when exposed to light. Or other methods, so this is a negative, or a positive, right? All of them, they reacted to the light, which was then processed chemically. So kind of the same thing, right? This film, so you see this negative, it looks kind of orange. Underneath that <coughs> orange masking layer, there are three layers in the film, one to record reds, one to record um, yellows, and one to record blues, right? And so it would mix it all together in film. Same sort of thing, right? <coughs> um, and, and so, they used the same process in the digital world that they did in the, in, the, uh, in the film world, but it's done electronically now. Photography, though, is really all about seeing, right? Um, it is called the art of seeing. You know, if you think about some of the, the famous painters, I'm a big fan of the Hudson River School of landscape painting, right? If you think about the famous painters, what they did is they would go somewhere, especially Hudson River School folks, they'd go out and they'd take their little notebooks and they'd make some drawings and record various pieces and bits. And typically they would go into their studio and use their, their notes from the field to create a new scene. Right? So they started with something blank, start with a blank canvas, literally, right? and then added elements until they were satisfied with what they got. 
with photography, the process is reversed. So usually what you're doing is looking at a big broad scene in front of you, and the purpose of photography is to extract and simplify down to something that you can, that conveys the message that you want to convey, right? And you'll find often that people that are struggling to generate photos that they're pleased with have a hard time with that process. They struggle in simplifying what's in front of them to something that makes sense, right? That, that someone else can consume potentially. So, so that's just, uh, that's an important key to understanding photography. Okay, so some famous photographers. The, the one in the upper left there, that's Ansel Adams, standing there with this big massive view camera, right? Eight by 10 piece of film sitting behind that bellows. And he's under there, but they, they all went through kind of the same process. They'd have to get to a place. They would have to set up, envision what they were going to, what they wanted to achieve with their photograph, compose and expose. And then there was a whole additional process that happened on the backside. So clicking that shutter was really just the first part. Once they clicked the shutter, they would have to actually develop the film. They would print a context sheet, which was kind of, hey, what, what is this gonna look like just with some base layers? They would select what images they actually wanted to, to finally print, do a test print, make modifications, and then do their final printing. Um, and the notes on those prints were pretty substantial. So here's an example. So this is from Magnum Photos, photo of Audrey Hepburn. And you'll notice here on this test print, all of these notes. And these notes are telling the printer, if it's not the same person who did it, even if it is the same person, here's how I want to adjust this base print to come to the final print. So, so what kinds of things do you maybe notice when you're looking at the final print versus what changes today? The final print's a lot lighter. It is. The final print's lighter. You can see people in the door, the image of the door. Yeah. So, see the people in the image of the door? Look at the notes on her face. They did stuff to her nose, right? Her nose is really bright here. It's actually not as bright there. So they burned it in. The stripes on the collar are much brighter in the final print than they were in the test print. Lots of different adjustments were made. There's a whole process. And they called it dodging and burning, where they would hold back light while it's so, so you create this, you create a negative, right? And in order to create the final print, you shine light through the negative onto a piece of photographic paper that would then be developed to create the final print. Well, the light coming through the negative is all going to be the same. But when they print it, what they want to do is they want to either hold light back so that it stays white or give more light in there so that you know, hold light back or, or so that it's darker. Right? So they darken up certain parts of the image or light, so it's, so it's called dodging and burning. And they would actually do that physically with, they'd have, they would either make masks that they could use to print, and they would print it in stages, or they'd have little tools that they would use to just basically hover over a part of the image and hold some of the light back for one or two seconds while the print was being exposed. So a lot happened in addition to just um, clicking the shutter, right? And I think oftentimes people, when they're doing their own photography, all they want to do is click the shutter and move forward, right? So film technology changed a lot over the years. And as a result, what photographers needed to do to generate their final images or what they could do with that technology changed as well, right? So originally there were either glass or metal plates that were used. Um, I have a friend that does that today. He does, he uses metal plates and actually makes his own chemicals pours them on the plates, and then uses one of those, you know, the old-fashioned view cameras to, uh, to generate those images. So 
glass or metal plates used to be a thing. Um, they went from black and white to film. The film speeds changed over time. So they, it used to be that film was very, very slow. You may, have, you may recall or may have seen before that um, photographs of people, which is mostly what was done in the early days, they never smile, right? And they, they just looked kind of stiff, and it was because they had to be. It would take 10, 15, 20, 30 seconds to, to make an exposure. The film was really slow. The chemicals were really slow, very unresponsive to light. And so people would have to sit just board stiff rigid in order to get a nice clear picture, okay? So film speeds have changed. There was, um, and it's making a comeback now, there was a time when we experimented with instant film, right? So you guys are familiar with the Polaroids, right? The thing with Polaroids is it does the same process as a negative and print would do, except it's all or positive, except there's a little piece of, um, in the film itself, there was a little um, plastic pocket that held the developing chemicals. And after you exposed it and it ejected the film, that little plastic pocket would be broken and the chemicals would go in uh, to, the rest of the, to the rest of the film and actually develop it while you're watching. <clears throat> so that's what Polaroids were. So they went from only negatives and now had to, to direct positives which became very popular for a long time because they're much, much easier than the CDs, but these are all slides, right? You guys remember going to Uncle Walt's uh, slideshow, right? His trip to, to Atlantic City or whatever, right? So, that, so technology has changed a lot over the years. And as the technology changed, photographers were able to do more and more sorts of stuff, right? So it used to be, for instance, that wildlife photography was extraordinarily difficult because the film was too slow to catch a moving subject. Um, one of my favorite photographers is named Elliot Porter. And I actually have a couple of books by Elliot Porter here in the library. Um, I have a number at home as well. He was really into taking pictures of birds as they came out of their nests. Well, what he had to do was he actually had to get up in the tree and set up his camera and build a big flash rig there and just leave it until the birds got used to it and would come in and out of their nests by his little his little photo setup. And then he would catch them as they were coming in or out of their nests and he used the flash to, to freeze the bird in place. Right? So you don't have to do that. Anymore, <laughs> right? um, things have changed. Okay. Digital technology, likewise, has changed, though the, uh, the pace of that change has really accelerated. Digital photography has really, really gotten going in the last 20 years or so. Um, pixel density in the cameras, right? It used to be some of the early cameras only were just a few megapixels at the most. Megapixel means a million pixels, so a thousand by a thousand. Now, there are cameras out there that have 100 plus megapixels. Right? So, um, the sensor size, lots of different sizes. They were very small. Right now, your cell phone has a little digital sensor in there. Little teeny tiny sensor. You will, you know, you can see that in there. Um, how fast digital cameras are today versus how fast they used to be. They can record in very low light. Didn't used to be able to do that. One of the things that you can do now with digital cameras that you never could before, and I didn't bring any of those photos with me, but um, you can do pinpoint stars at night. So they are fast enough to where you can get, you can record the stars fast enough so that they're not moving in the frame. It used to be that, you know, all you could, at best you could hope to do were star trails where you just leave the shutter open for minutes or hours as the stars move through and, and they draw lines across the frame, right? So um, the max, maximum number of frames per second. There are digital cameras out there now that will take not just 
not just cinema, but actual stills, 30 frames per second. You know, it's, just, it's just astonishing, right? Um, cell phones, I talked about vibration reduction is a, is a really big thing now, uh, particularly for people using the larger cameras. Um, they have two types of, they have a lens stabilization or a sensor stabilization. So one of the things that prevents a lot of people from getting good photos is that their camera isn't steady during a long exposure and so things can out blurry, right? And a lot of the more modern cameras will either, the, the lens will vibrate to try to adjust for any vibration that it feels and try to keep the lens centered on the sensor or the sensor itself will move within the camera to keep stabilization. So the more, the most modern cameras, they have what they call five axis stabilization. So they'll do roll, pitch, yaw, um, they, they move all over the place in order to keep that sensor stable with the image while you're taking the picture. And it allows you to do a lot of stuff handheld or in really windy conditions that you didn't used to be able to do and stuff in sharp images. So those are some things that will affect your photos. Right? Um, so I talked a little bit about sensor sizes earlier. You can see you know, the different cameras across the bottom, different size sensors. Uh, we don't need to spend a lot of time on this. But basically, the larger the sensor, the more expensive the camera is, unfortunately, but the larger the sensor, also the, the more clean your images tend to be. Because what happens is, as the sensors get smaller, it's really easy to get introduced motion, right? And that's just, that's just math. So a slight, a tiny move of your sensor on your cell phone results in a big difference in what's, uh, what's actually seen in the sensor versus a larger sensor. So how do I get better photos? Um, the first thing we wanted to talk about today is getting there, right? So photography is all about the light. Um, being in the right place at the right time is what photography is, particularly nature and landscape photography is all about. Right? So the location counts too, obviously, right? If you're not, if you're taking a picture of a garbage dump, it's probably not going to look like, you know, if you're interested in landscape and nature. Maybe what you want. But um, it's all about the light. And being there when the light is right is key. And when you're talking about landscape and nature again, being there during the right season is also key. So um, these are all photos that I've taken. The eclipse photo, that's coming up again next year. So if you want to start looking, if you want to start Planning for that. There's lots of resources online that will teach you how to get the, the eclipse photos. I won't go into that today. But you have to be in the right place. The sky needs to be not cloudy. So maybe have a couple of different options for where you want to be. Being there at the right time of day. So this one required getting up very early in the morning, driving about 40 minutes, hiking for a mile-ish, um, and then waiting for the light. Okay. Long hike on this one, difficult location to get to. Um, overcast light. This one, the final one was uh, more a fortuitous sort of a circumstance. It was actually raining. We, uh, we were just driving around and saw that off in the distance. Stopped the car, got out because the light was right and took the photo. So, Right? You can plan, but the weather is always going to do what the weather is going to do. So, I'll talk a little more about planning in a minute. You'll notice, so let me show a couple of photos from the same location, taken at different times, so you can see the effect of good light versus not so good light. So this is Blackwater Falls in West Virginia. Uh, this is probably around 11 o'clock in the morning. You can see that the light is pretty harsh. The shadows are really dark and deep. Um, it was too bright to be able to leave the, leave the shutter open long enough to get the water to flow through the image very well. Right? 
So middle of the day for landscape photography, typically not very good. One of the things that you need to know about landscape photography is if you want to be in the right place at the right time, it typically means that you're going to be up early and out taking photos when most people are just getting out of bed. The middle of the day isn't so good, and then you're probably going to be up late uh, taking photos while people are eating dinner or getting ready to wrap it, wrap it up for the day, right? So, pretty common. So this same location, a few hours later, the clouds moved in, and we were obviously in a different place, but the clouds moved in and got a much better result. So, same location, same day, different times of day, yield different results. This is the most common reason why your photos don't look the way that you see, uh, you know, when you look at things and say, well, I was there, it didn't look like that when I was there. Typically that's one, because you weren't there when the light was good. And often, a lot of places, the light can only be good for a couple of minutes a day. And so being there at the right time um, becomes key and is one of the real challenges. Okay, so how do I get there? Right? You have to plan. You can't, you can't have the, you know, the fortunate moments, but generally speaking, planning is key. I spend a lot of time on Google Maps. How long is it going to take me to get there? And all trails. How long is it going to take me to walk this trail from where I'm starting to where I'm going to be? And then another one that I use is sunrisesunset.com. So those three help me know when the light's going to be good, how to get there, how long it's going to take me to get there. And if it's a place I've never been to before, I will typically try to allow myself a little additional time to scout around and find the best location while I'm there. Or I'll go back multiple times. So there's some locations here in Arkansas that I've been back to five, six, seven times. I know there's a good photo there, but I still haven't found it because I haven't been able to get there when the, when the time is right, when the light is right, and when you know, the conditions are right. So, some of it's a challenge, you know, and some of it, uh, it really takes persistence. But, that said, keep your eyes open, right? So, this was from um, a trip, again, that same trip to Virginia and West Virginia that we took last year. Uh, this was just, we had kind of done the early morning sunrise stuff, and we're just walking a trail, just kind of taking a look to see what there was to see, and ran across this scene. Um, the clouds were moving in and out, the light was changing rapidly, and, you know, sometimes you get good stuff when you don't necessarily plan. So it's always a good, it's always good to keep your eyes open. And I showed you this photo again, right? Same sort of thing. Just driving along, looking out the car windows as we're driving. Oh, hey, that looks good over there. It was raining. Not necessarily when most people want to be out, but bad weather often makes for good photos. So um, I was really <coughs> pleased with the result there. The furnace was changing. Okay. Let me pause and just ask if there are any questions before I go into the next section. Now. Any questions? Okay. Okay, so equipment. It's not about the pots and pans, but they can help. So why do I have a picture of pots and pans? One of the first questions I always get when people look at my photographs is, what kind of a camera do you have? Well, that's it's kind of important, but it's also kind of not important. Right? You can get good photos with just about any equipment that you have. The best camera that you can have is the one that's with you. Right? If you don't have one with you, you have the best camera in the world, it's not going to help you. Okay? So, you wouldn't go into a, a restaurant, eat a nice meal, and say, hey, what kind of pots and pans do you have? And really, it's, it's about the process of getting, getting things right. The equipment, it does help. Right? 
It can help you do things kind of out on the fringes that you might not be able to do with lesser equipment. But that's not the key, okay? So, like I said, right? Decide, so, so how do I pick what kind of gear I want to use? Well, first of all is decide what kind of photography you want to do. And you will be able to find, and there are lots of books here in the library, that will show you not only photos, but the, the actual data that they used to record that image. So they'll talk about shutter speed and uh, f-stop and you know, what ISO they use, all those sorts of things to help you understand both the length of the lens, to help you understand that. So decide what you want to do, research that, and then research a lot of good photography. Take a look at other images. Um, I think it's important to be able to learn to read other people's images, right? What kind of day, what type of time of day might they have been out where they were? Where, where might they have been standing? Um, is this a long focal length lens or is it a short one? Is this gonna be a long shutter speed or a short one? And I've got some more information, right? Uh, learn about the basic creative controls and then find the limits. There will always be something more expensive to spend your money on. Okay. Unfortunately, photography is not a particularly cheap hobby um, if you get real serious about it. But you don't need the best, the fanciest. You know, I, I see a lot of people out on some of the forums where they're talking about specific equipment and they say, well, my camera can do X, Y, Z, whereas yours can only do X and Y. And, and then the, the immediate question to that is, well, when do you need to do Z? Which is, Often the case is almost never. Okay. So think about what it is that you might actually need to be able to do. Okay, so let's talk about the digital darkroom. I talked earlier about the printing process, right? The same thing happens in the digital world. The other reason why your images don't look like some of the images that you've seen, and it's probably the main reason is, is that you're sticking with the default that comes straight out of the camera, not doing any of your own processing or developing work, right? So in your camera, when you click a shutter and you take a JPEG photo, the camera is making all of the processing decisions for you. It's deciding how much contrast to add or subtract. It's deciding where to put the highlights, where to put the shadows, all of that sort of stuff for you. Most, a lot of cameras, in fact, a lot of cell phone cameras States will allow you to shoot in what's called RAW. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Digital, digital darkroom, right? So one of the benefits of some of the modern tools is now you can keep a digital catalog. I have bins and bins and bins full of this stuff, right? Very difficult to go through, very difficult to know where things are. I actually have, it's, it's, not as high on my list as it probably ought to be, but I do have on my list a project to go through and get rid of all the junk and to catalog it, and you know, but, but it's gonna take a long time to do that. In the digital world, one of the benefits you have is that a lot of the applications, they actually have a catalog right in there. This is from um, Adobe Lightroom. These are from a trip I took to Alaska earlier this year, some of the images that, that um, I kept from that trip. So, one of the benefits of the digital darkroom. So here is mask on, mask off, right? So you get to see behind the curtain on the left. On the left is the image straight out of the out of the camera. This is what's called the raw image. No processing applied to it at all. It's just straight out of the camera. Um, give you a little background. Uh, in August, September, end of August, first of September, I took a trip to Wrangell St. Elias National Park in the southeastern corner of Alaska. Um, we flew on a bush plane into the backcountry and spent five nights in the backcountry with our cameras and backpacks hiking around and taking pictures. One of the opportunities that we had while we were there was that there's a lake at the bottom of this glacier that, for some reason unknown to anyone, drained. The lake drained and left a lot of icebergs stranded out there in the mud. 
So one of the one of the things that we did while we were there was we dropped right in the mud up to our knees on this old lake bed, taking pictures of these stranded glaciers. It was raining the whole day. It was raining while I was taking this picture. Um, and as I mentioned, right, bad weather can make for good photos. So, so this is kind of how it looked to the naked eye. It was pretty bland. The sky was gray. Everything, right, was sort of neutral. So let's talk about some changes that I did to the image. Okay, first of all, I didn't add any color to the image. All of the colors that are here were there in the original photo. So part of the deal here is learning how to see what's in that image that you've taken and pull it out. So if you look at the image on the left, for instance, you can see all of the blue that's in the glaciers, right? So learning how to pull that out in the digital darkroom, that's one of the things that you can do. The sky, even though it looks kind of flat, there's detail there. So when I processed the image, I isolated the sky. And I enhanced that detail that was there. I didn't put it in there. I didn't paint it on with a brush or anything like that. All I did was increase the contrast in the sky so that you could see the detail that was already there. Um, a lot of times in an image, you want your eye to rest somewhere, right? And it tends to rest in the vital parts of the image. Well, this foreground here is a little distracting and it's maybe a little bit bright. So, I darkened up the foreground just a little bit, which brings your eye back up to more of the center of the image. So that's that's some stuff that you can learn how to do in the system uh, and, the, and the various tools that you can use for developing. So when you see photos out on the internet, typically that you know that look like well, my photos don't look like that. It's because they're processing their own images and making choices on what to do. Right? I move the blacks down, I move the whites up, I mean lots of different stuff. There were probably 30 or 40 steps that I took to adjust this photo before I got there. I remember was having a conversation about how, you know, you take a picture and it's not what you saw. What I saw that, but my camera gave me that. And so doing the processing kind of helps you recreate what you saw because the you know the camera's just it's equalizing everything. It's making everything yeah. the same. And so you have to kind of do things to recreate your vision. Correct. Now the raw is you turned off the auto settings or that's what the auto settings gave you. So the raw image is just the straight data that was recorded on the digital sensor without any sort of adjustment to it at all. So I made exposure choices right, that are recorded in the raw image. So I chose what shutter speed to use, I chose what f stop to use, I chose what ISO. But in terms of um, making any choices about contrast or lighting or anything like that, None of that was is done in a raw image. It is it is truly like a negative. Right? So if you think about go back to that image that we had of Audrey Hepburn with all the processing notes for printing, same sort of thing. It was the original negative, if you printed just straight from the negative, was kind of dull. And so what they did is they said, okay, when I print it, I want to make these adjustments to the base information. Ansel Adams, for instance, was famous for that. In fact, he developed a whole system that he called the zone system. And it was all about from 10, I got this right, um, being, being absolute black to zero being absolute white, right? Mm -hmm. And understanding where his images were in those ranges, he would adjust his developing to adjust the density of the negative, and he would adjust his printing to adjust the, the final to the print to get what he wanted, right? And that's, it's exactly the same process. It's just done today with digital tools, right? um, Another thing that I did was I selected just the main subject here, right? Just the icebergs in the front and did some individual adjustment to that. So 
that brought the whites up so that it, it became a little brighter and really stood out. Mm -hmm. So, um, when I first shifted to digital photography, I was used to shooting color positive films, so slides mostly. And um, it was very difficult for me because I was used to seeing the final image and you know right away, is this good or bad, right? You can just look at the slide and say, is it good or bad? When I switched to digital, my images, they, they were all coming out kind of dull. It's like, why are they so dull? I know I exposed this problem because I didn't understand the processing side. So, so here's a little bigger view of the final process image. I may make some more adjustments to this before I print it. Uh, one of the things I, I don't particularly care for right now is that up close to the top of this iceberg, you can see how it's a little bit lighter. Mm -hmm. I might want to burn that in a little bit. I think it's got oh, too much of a halo around it. Um, but it's, it's getting close. So that, you know, there's one of um, All right. So it really is about creativity, right? And how do I unleash my creativity? Um, there are all kinds of resources out there and available. You'd be amazed at how much is out there on YouTube. They can go and just say, hey, how do I process landscape images? And there, there are people that won't are out there and will for free show you with whatever tool you have to process your images, they'll show you how to do it. Uh, this screen grab is from a tool called, or a, a website called Creative Live. It's one that I subscribe to and have purchased a lot of different courses out there and you can purchase them. And they will show you, and some of them, you know, they have uh, basic landscape photography processing, will show you end to end and be like, 10, 30 minute lessons or something like that. And you can go through each month and they'll show you all of the steps end to end on how to improve your photos. Um, some of these are a little more, a little more detailed, um, but yeah, and lots of tools out there. Um, one of the great things about digital is that unlike this world, right, when you're shooting these, where it costs you like six bucks or more every time you click the shutter. Mm -hmm. Once you've invested in your initial equipment and you've got your memory card, you can take photos and photos and photos and photos. you can just keep going and going and going. And same thing on the processing side. Right? Make a copy of your photo before you start developing it. Develop it, play around with it, and uh, you can keep trying until you find what you like. There, there's, there are so many opportunities out there to do things in the digital world that didn't used to exist previously. All right, so that's mostly what I've got for you today. Uh, there's, I mean, if you want, let, let me stop and ask if there are any questions. I can talk about exposure plus any questions. You uh, were focusing on outside landscape photos. Yes. But I notice, I mean, I'm a photographer, but most of what I do is inside, and the light inside is harsh, it's all directly overhead, or it's too dark, and there's a window in the corner that throws anything off. Is there anything we can do before we even pick up the camera, you know, that's going to do something about horrible inside light? Um. Yeah, so, so the lengths that indoor photographers go to to get better light are pretty extreme. Mm -hmm. So they do things like use flash or off-camera lighting. They'll use reflectors. They do lots of different stuff to adjust and balance the light to make it better. Um, I'm not an expert in that sort of stuff, but yes, and you can go to the same sorts of resources like Creative Live, um, YouTube, Lots of op options out there to go and learn how to do that sort of stuff. But yeah, it's, it's a whole different world. It's a completely different skill set. Any other questions? No? Did I put you all to sleep? Bored you to death?
Let me let me show you just a couple more things. That we've got a couple more minutes. Okay, so there are basically three creative controls that you may or may not have on your camera, depending on what it is. The first is aperture. Aperture represents the the size of the opening when you're in your lens when you're taking a picture. And a lot of cameras you can adjust that as you go. You can do that on a cell phone. In some cases, usually in a very limited way. They don't have a lot of options there. Yes? Can you tell us what? We can't do that unless we're in like pro mode though. Right? Correct. Oh, so. Yeah. Yeah, you have to be in pro mode on your phone, and, and I'm not an expert on cell phone photography. I know people that teach entire courses on cell phone photography too, so. Um, this stuff takes time, right? Let, let, me, let me pause there. This stuff takes time. I've been serious about photography for more than 40 years now. Um, I've been actively engaged in serious photography now for 30. So it takes time. Um, some people are wunderkinds, right? They get it right away and they're really good at it. Um, I don't know that I, you know, I, I continue to try to learn, but uh, be patient with yourself as you work through this. But aperture, so aperture controls how fast the light gets to the sensor and controls depth of field. So let's talk about depth of field. Very important concept. Depth of field is what, how much of your picture is in focus from front to back, okay? So if I'm in the camera here and my subject's off in the distance here, how much in front of that subject, how much behind that subject is in focus depends on your aperture. And going back to this previous image, the wider the opening, the shallower that range of um, distance will be in focus. So with really small apertures, you get much more in focus. Okay, so that's one. Two. So, so here's an example. Right, showing you depth of field. So wide aperture. On all three of these pictures, we're focusing on this little cat sitting on the, the pedestal, right? At 2.8, which is wide, this is counterintuitive. The smaller the number, the wider the hole. Right? The, the focus is only on the cat. On kind of a medium one, you get more in focus, and on a small one, you get even more in focus. Okay? So that's one. Here's an example of something with a fairly shallow depth of field. The background is all out of focus, and here's something where very deep depth of field from everything from close to far away. Okay, shutter speed. So slow shutter. When something is moving, you get a blurry picture. Right? You'll often see water pictures, right? And I showed you waterfall earlier, where the water was moving through the frame. Slow shutter speed. The faster you go the more it'll stop stuff. I was in an air show once taking pictures of planes with props and had my shutter speed too high and so when I got all of my photos, when I, when I was processing all of my photos, I had frozen that prop in place. Not as aesthetically pleasing as if it were moving a little bit. So, lesson learned on that one, right? And then the final is, so again, right? So, fast shutter speed, is that on Beaver Lake? Slow shutter speed. This is like a two minute exposure and you can see the clouds moving through the picture. And then the final is ISO. And I don't remember what ISO stands for, forgive me, but it's how fast the sensor is actually recording the image once the light reaches it. So the slower you go, the more clean the image will be. The higher you go, you can see, especially here in the sky, you see how it's all kind of dots here in the sky versus over here where it's smoother. It's called digital noise. And what happens is, as you're taking that picture, as you crank up the energy going into the, or the, the power going into the sensor, it heats up and that heat bleeds over between the pixels on the sensor and it causes what's called noise. So. Those are the three main creative controls. All right, I think that's what I've got for you folks. What other questions do you have for me today? 
why would you want the uh, since it makes that noise, why would you want the, the higher ISO? If it's because if it's dark, yeah. If it's dark, it's gonna take a long time to record the image. So so those three, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO, all act in a big triangle. And if you adjust one, the other two are going to have to potentially adjust as well. Right? So I can choose, if it's dark, I can choose a very low ISO, but if I want to get an image out of it, I mean, they're gonna to have to have a very long shutter speed or a very wide aperture, or in some cases, both. Same thing if I go with a wide aperture and it's bright, I may have to use a very low ISO or a very, very fast shutter speed. Okay. Or with the shutter speed, if I want to use a long shutter speed, I'm either going to have to use a small aperture or um, a low ISO. Right? So it all kind of balances each other. Yes? I'm so I know all that like the ISO capture stuff, but does a lens matter when it comes to stuff? Or is like can you get any lens capability? So so the lens matters in a couple of different ways. The lens determines what apertures you can use, because it's going to be limited. Right? Um, faster lenses tend to be much more expensive. But uh, and then the other thing is the focal length of the lens determines how wide the view is. So that's what your lens will have to determine. Okay. Right? So a longer focal length lens limits the perspective, narrows it down, and a wide angle lens opens it up so you can see more in the picture. And I'm, I'm not sure what kind of camera you have. Uh, I have a Canon Okay. What kind of lens do you have on? Uh, you know? I'm really not sure. Okay. It probably has a zoom lens on that. So so you can use some different uh, photos. Yeah, that's why the difference. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. All right. Well, well thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.